Right, can everyone see everything okay? Yeah, okay, good, perfect. So um, my name is Kate Zuzek. Uh, I'm studying my Bachelor of Arts in saxophone and I play baritone saxophone at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. Um, I wanted to just thank the saxophone studio, UWSP saxophone studio for having me today. Uh, I know you guys be lecturing about a lot of stuff. Um, so I appreciate you taking the time to listen to me today. Uh, I also wanna thank my parents for popping in and uh, a couple of my friends as well and a couple of professors if they happen to join in at any point. So thank you guys for coming in to listen. I really appreciate it. Um, finish off a little bit. Uh, I'm a seventh year, super, super, super senior here. And this is my final semester. Uh, and this is my capstone presentation. Today, I will be talking to you about a lecture on interpreting Bach cello suites on baritone saxophone. So first we'll start with um, Bach. It's important to talk a little bit about J.S. Bach. Um, his dates obviously are very reflective to the period that he existed in. Uh, he passed away in 1750 and the Baroque period ended in 1750, which is very crucial to just how powerful and impactful he was as a composer. And um, during the times that this became important with the cello suites, um, this was about his midlife. So about 1717 to 1723, he was what was called the Koppelmeister, um, which after a little bit of research, a uh, chapel master, um, choral master, composer and residency type stuff. So he did everything essentially. Um, and awesome, good for him. And it was under Prince Leopold. And during this time is when he decided to develop this idea of composing these cello suites, which was, suites, which was actually for a completely different instrument. Um, and I'll get into that now. Um, he had a lot of knowledge at the time of what's called the viola da gamba, um, or viola da gamba. Um, sometimes it's referred to as a viol, there's a couple other terms I've seen for it. And in comparison to cello, cello is a four string uh, non-fret instrument with a hollow body and a vibrational stick. Um, and the viola da gamba almost takes on a bit of a guitar-like form while still being um, played in a similar fashion between the legs. Uh, more like a six string instrument, sometimes seven strings, and it has frets. So it really changes the ability to interpret and actually accomplish chords and that type of difference really changed over um, the transcriptions over time of the suites themselves. But initially it started for a composition for viola da gamba. Um, and due to that, these different styles had to be changed as well as string tunings to just different strings being used. Um, the suites themselves are loosely based off of stylized dances. Um, stylized dances, the best way to describe those are not dances. Uh, there's no physical dancing to the actual uh, suites, um, but it does have a characteristic to it that replicates dances. Um, some of it has to do with meter, uh, some of it has to do with interpretation of the articulations, dynamics, emphasis, um, et cetera. And a couple of the different um, types of movements you'll see within the suites are the prelude, allemande, courant, saraband, and G. Uh, there are multiple versions of the scores that exist as far as the Bach cello suites. Um, one of the suites actually has a signed copy or signed um, signature from Bach himself. So they try to believe that that's the most authentic version. Um, there's a lot of debate between that, which is why you'll see on the PowerPoint, I put um, mistakes and quotes. Um, because of these different versions, it's really important to point out that there's some level of authenticity to look back on that signed version, but um, interpretation is also very important as we start to transfer this to other instruments um, and also trying to figure out um, the best way to interpret what was written then. Obviously, at some point, we started to rely on different um, arrangements or transcriptions of the actual music. Given that it was handwritten and quite hard to get at the time, there's a lot of those original types almost that actually exist. Whether it had a signature, it best represented that. Um, for my saxophonist to the right, uh, that actually is my music that I'm performing off of. So feel free to kind of critique it. Um, the transcription that I took in this from was a book that I had gotten from Professor Hastings uh, many years ago, my freshman year. And it's by Trent Kiniston, um, really great saxophonist and professor. He did a really great job at um, formulating this book. He has an introductory uh, couple pages actually that kind of covers this same idea of Bach interpretation and how to best transfer this uh, for saxophone actually. So I didn't steal a lot of my resources from there, but I at least wanted to show you guys the sheet music I was using. Um, I will be showing you other sheet music to follow off of so you don't have to see all these gross pencil markings, but figured I'd at least keep it real. <laughs> so before I get into a little bit of uh, comparative recordings, 
just want to talk about a few terms. Uh, just a moment here. So a couple terms that I'd like to cover are harmonic emphasis. Uh, that idea will tie into polyphony a little bit later, but this is more um, the structure of a chord and choosing to harm, um, emphasize a different, you know, different note. Generally, when, when we give her a, a stacked chord, major chord of some form, um, one, three, five, will have the tendency to hear more of that three as it emphasizes the chord, but there's a lot of, there's three notes to choose from, there's a way of attacking it, there's approach, so harmonic emphasis in itself is sort of that choice within that structure. Um, Rubato, which also ties a little bit into um, a term agogic, which I'll be getting into a little bit later, um, is just the idea of slowing down, speeding up to create some drama within a piece. Um, I still say that it still has to be metrically appropriate. Um, you're still kind of keeping the concept of meter in mind while also exercising, um, being able to do pull and push within a piece. Uh, next, we'll go a little bit into implied polyphony. Um, I just want to read the definition because it's just the most well put, but it's um, the suggestion of multiple melodic lines being simultaneously played on a single instrument. So the implication is that it's trying to be polyphonic. Um, this creates an idea of harmony on a monophonic instrument, which is really cool. Um, it's a concept to really think a little bit deeper on, but it's really cool to be able to make this transfer, as we'll hear a little bit in the recordings. Uh, some examples of that are taking apart double stops as they are some form of chordal structures. Um, and grace notes as they're implemented within arrangements and transcriptions, as grace notes are some form of emphasizing some kind of harmonic or melodic extra and something that we should uh, pay, attention in a con pay attention to in a contrapuntal way. So hopefully this slide works out okay. I'll tell you it's been a little weird because there are three, yep, three YouTube videos on here. So bear with me if anything sounds weird, if it's loud, um, just adjust your volume as needed. Uh, so I will start by playing uh, the upper left corner is uh, Celis Misha uh, He is still playing, I believe. Uh, he's a little bit up there in age, but um, when I was playing cello back in the day, which I think you saw pictures probably of before, um, he was someone that I had actually studied fairly in-depthly to learn some of the cello suites back then. hear a lot of that example of the harmonic emphasis I was trying to talk about right away, which um, within those double stops, you know, there's chordal concepts um, that can be ideas of polyphony of a different line idea that's trying to move. And the really interesting part with uh, Mr. Maisky is he's Armenian. So I'm not quite sure if some kind of influence from his country might be involved in there by any means. But the more interesting facet is that he chose by his interpretation to emphasize a little bit more of that harmonic, harmonized note versus what we even consider the melody at the time. Uh, now I'll go a little bit into Mr. Misislav Rostropovich, um, someone that we consider quite a classical influence in the cello world, um, phenomenal player, and I shouldn't say more, I'll just let it get into the recording. So in that one, obviously, it's a much slower tempo. Um, we call them the old school classical, uh, pre-Yo-Yo Ma era, actually, and the cello research I've done as well as my playing. Um, he really represented a lot as far as what to take note of, um, interpreting Bach, uh, just playing cello. Um, he had a very pronounced sound you could hear, um, very loud and resonant. Obviously, he, you know, take note that he was in a chapel, but also in Misha Maisky's recording, he's in a, a smaller chapel, actually, but it's on a box stage. So those obviously will affect things such as recording quality, but you can still very much hear out of both of them this presence of sound that's different. Um, there's a lot more rubato choice I heard out of Rostropovich. Uh, um, even towards the top of the line, you felt like he was pulling you there just to finally get you to land and find his way that um, his phrasing worked very well with the rubato and dynamics included um, 
although quite a loud approach, it was still clear, but it was a good slow build within his own playing. Um, now I will play a little bit of Yo-Yo Ma. Um, he has become a little bit more of a staple, as I said. Um, but in this case, sometimes this recording becomes a little bit debated because he takes a very interesting approach, which is actually why I wanted to share it with you guys. I just want to point out actually at the very end there that last note you'll hear from if you heard a couple of the excerpts before um, that note was touched and it actually is a grace noted um, attempt at double stop note so it actually comes on a much lower string and therefore it has the resonance of being a double stop but the choice he made was actually to not use it at all um, his interpretation by itself there was a, almost an elimination of a, an ornamentation there so Yo-Yo Ma obviously took it quite fast, um, and I'll go into a little bit of those details in a second, um, but he was very accurate and had quite a crispness to the sound, but played quiet. Um, I really appreciated also this idea of snappy grace notes. Um, it's not something I hear so commonly within, uh, within Bach's interpretive playing, and so I really appreciate to just kind of hear a little bit of a change, and that's why I wanted to bring his recording into here. Um, he used this really interesting idea of rubato and rhythmic variance, um, you know, the idea of changing around the rhythms, just, you know, something like two eighth notes to a dot of eighth to sixteenth. Um, and this really gave a different kind of tug and pull. And I would even argue that still it doesn't change the interpretation, whatever a piece of music might say. Uh, the man has spent a lot of time versing himself and Bach uh, to be able to really, I feel like, convincingly tell us what he, Bach intended as well as Yo-Yo Ma's intention too alongside it. Um, again, I'll point out the... Uh, range of dynamics between all three. I would say Misha Maisky kept things quite moderate. Uh, Rostropovich was quite loud and then Yo-Yo Ma had quite a dynamic range and kept things actually rather soft. Now here's the tough part is whenever I change the slide, so pardon me if anything's too loud. There we go, okay, thank you. So um, we'll go a little bit into tempo. Uh, sorry about kind of going a little bit into it now, but I'll try to be a little bit quicker. Um, the tempo generally, is, and at least in my music, music that I've been reading off of, um, that I've been finding, has been eighth note equals 80. Um, so the range that I found for these guys, uh, which later on in Yo-Yo Ma's performance gets a bit faster, but it's about eighth note equals 80 to 110. Um, and I'm really rounding the 80 up as the first two performers really played fast, but Yo-Yo Yo Ma's numbers really dragged it up a little bit. Um, so Misha played a little bit slower, a bit more meticulous, and this ended up being a little bit more of a staple recording based on a lighter interpretation. So he stayed a little bit closer, about eighth note equals 72, um, with a little bit of rubato incorporated to set him back to about eighth note equals 65 to 68, uh, what I clocked in. Um, we go to Rostropovich, who is a bit more methodical, but much slower, and really played into a rubato-based variant, which dragged around his time quite often. So in order to clock it, it was a little difficult. Um, but that one became about eighth note equals 70 for about a starting tempo, uh, and with the variations dropped to as low as eighth note equals 59, which in all honesty, I don't remember the last time I've played a piece that even had that written in the uh, written in as that slow. So something I had to learn to exercise a bit more, of course. Um, to see Yo-Yo Ma obviously played much faster than both of them almost combined. So uh, calculating was a bit tough. I had, took me a couple tries, but I got about eighth note equals 85 for about a starting place. But quite immediately you'll hear that he took his time with some rubato and rhythmic variations that it was tough to catch you know, there's nothing uh, score-based really to go off of what he did unless we were to go do a transcription for him. Um, and so he did an amazing job with pushing, obviously, with this 85 uh, eighth note, which obviously is only five clicks above what we consider normal. Um, but these variations would drag him back as far as eighth note equals 65 and eighth note equals, and as high as eighth note equals about 100, which is quite fast for this piece. Um, the differences still would be uh, the treatment of implied polyphony. Um, this kind of ties in a little bit again to the harmonic emphasis. Uh, 
you have the choices with using uh, these bottom grace notes that Yo-Yo Ma and his performance decided to opt out. Um, these ideas too of stacked double stops or chordal buildings, sometimes even triple stops, um, that would allow for you to pick one of the other notes other than what we consider the melodic line to emphasize. And I would say, you know, Misha Maisky decided to choose something else. And that actually is kind of why Ross Rapowicz became a little bit more of the staple recording. It's because he kept things medium while being loud, pronounced, and still driven, which is kind of why things have, have shifted throughout the cello world as well as just observing Bach and interpretation, especially within the suites. Uh, grace notes, I would say, also apply into there. I think I just mentioned that briefly. Um, some commonalities, I would say, between the cellist is vibrato speed and vibrato fade. Um, this idea uh, is really interesting. Um, as a former cellist, uh, someone that likes to watch string players and go to orchestras, one really cool thing that I like to observe is the idea of strings being able to vibrate and resonate and the fact that their, their, their sound doesn't stop once the bow is lifted off. And that's why you'll see the commonality of vibrato still continuing off of the note, um, even without their, what would you consider their interaction of the playing being done for the most part. Um, and obviously that's not something we should neglect as uh, saxophonists, as other instrumentalists, because our air stops, sure, but there might be some implications of needing it to continue all the way to niente, and how do you fade that well? How do you apply this? And in this case, um, with string players, you hear a lot more of this idea of vibrato fade, where the note will disappear within the bowing, but the vibrato will stay almost until the very end. Um, the speeds for, for vibrato were fairly consistent with all three. Um, I, it makes me curious if maybe that was more of a Baroque choice, um, Baroque, Baroque based choice, um, and whether that's something that I would need to look even deeper into, honestly, within the cello playing aspects. Um, another idea, too, that would create some difference that is also considered a commonality would still be the treatment of double stops. Um, you still would hear the melody within all three, and that was not taken away by whatever emphasis they chose. So I still would say that the commonality is that you still were able to get that to come across. All right. So now I'm going to get into someone that basically gave me the beef of my presentation, Hendrik or Henk Van Twiller. Uh, he is a baritone saxophonist, as well as wrote an incredible dissertation on um, Bach interpretation, actually, for the saxophone. So, best kind of source I could have found. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Boothroyd, for that one. Um, so, I'm going to play a little bit first, um, and then I'll talk a little bit with you guys, sort of like a discussion. And, of course, in the Q&As, I'd love to hear from you guys if you have anything. <laughs> Honestly, wonderful recording. I love the um, the resonance the sound has. Of course, I wouldn't know where he recorded it, so it looks like it's album art, so I'd imagine he's got pretty decent studio recording equipment to make this work, but I, I digress. Great sound. Um, but again, to bounce off of that, he had a larger, fuller sound, which makes me think that he was working to kind of mimic that resonance, that hollow body of the cello at this time, to be able to really accomplish what he wanted or considered interpretive to Bach on saxophone or Bach on cello even, too. Um, this idea of string imitation kind of comes from the vibrato fade, as I had mentioned before, um, the idea of letting the note go all the way until the breath releases and, you know, keeping your vibrato consistent still while it actually sustains. Um, I found that also just the vibrato use in general seemed to really be mimicry of a cellist. You know, there's a lot of vibrato use where you can apply it, where it can be implicated in a good place. Um, Tempo-wise, if we had to do a comparative, uh, it was moderately fast. Um, it still, to me, sounded like a very interestingly perfect blend of all three. Um, I don't know quite too much about rhythmic variance in this one, not too, too much, honestly, but a lot more of the application of what all three actually provided as their interpretations in this case. Again, hopefully this will transfer well. Uh, doesn't start okay. So getting a little bit into his dissertation, 
uh, the dissertation it's, itself, uh, as I'll lift a little bit more from his words a little bit later, um, it makes us a little bit more aware that during the Baroque period, there was also the emphasis on the performer being just as important as the composer. And I felt that with the research I had found that that was very true in Bach's case, as he left a lot of his music up to interpretation. Um, you know, that makes for really beautiful arguments, such as the fact that you get the opportunity of hearing a different performance each time. Uh, on multiple different kinds of instruments in different locations, different ideas, and to have that template, if you would, to work with. And obviously some of this is considered etude-based work. Yeah, etude-based work in this case, you know. Um, that also means that it has its very specific purposes and what it might be teaching you as well, too. Um, of course, with that idea of interpretation, you can't forget the concepts of making it a good performance. Um, as well as including some of the essential elements that are already part of the suites itself. So a little bit more that I was able to rip apart from Van Twillert's dissertation that were what I consider um, emphatic wording he had to say about how to approach these ideas, what he had to say about them. It's very tough to find um, instrument specific, but I think he did a really good way of at least being able to demonstrate it to us in a way we can understand. So first the idea of rubato. Um, I'm going to actually read a term to you that I discovered in this entire uh, research I had done, which is the idea of agogic, which I'm, I'm a little mad at myself I didn't understand before, which actually is already defined in the presentation for you. It says, concerned with duration, length, uh, stress rather than dyna dynamic, but I'd like to read what it says in New Grove. Uh, um, it says, uh, qualification of expression and particularly of accentuation and accent. The qualification is concerned with variation. Sorry variations of duration rather than of dynamic level. The, the agogic has to do with everything with the length and stress given to the note through extended duration. So it's very interesting to kind of think on this concept, you know, it, it kind of broadened my thinking on rubato as its use. Um, and he also talks about the fact that it's a very useful tool in being able to express melody, um, which is something I had even talked about before with just comparing the recordings. Um, he was able to di dictate that there's really nothing too honestly metrically symmetrical that demonstrates metrical symmetry, if you would, sorry, I want to speak properly, um, that would actually demonstrate it so fully that wouldn't allow for rubato, that wouldn't allow for more interpretation in this case. Um, so we get on to the concept of polyphony. Um, his thesis really aims a lot at articulation, but it also really heavily delves into a polyphony and implied polyphony. Um, he talks about what would be the insights uh, from art on the linear polyphony and its performance on a monophonic instrument, of course, baritone saxophone in this case for his dissertation. Um, it's important to understand what this idea of keeping it linear while understanding it as he puts it in a third dimensional object, which made me really think outside the box of polyphony, which I think might've been his point. Um, there's so many ways to try to attempt a double stop on a single singularized instrument. You'll hear in his playing that he found a way to be able to emphasize that lower note while popping to the upper because that was actually the double stop that was intended within the written cello music. So it's these concepts of how do I interpret polyphony? How do I carry that forward? And so he wanted to keep it in this idea of linear polyphony as a third dimensional object, which is very abstract. Um, so it's okay if that toggles with you a little bit. Again, these dissertations are still available to you, but I'm more than willing to talk to you um, about them afterwards. Um, he also gives a lot of aim at uh, the possibility of the same perspective of music, but through a new vision and instrument. So of course, better ways of interpreting polyphony and what we can do with it, um, whether it's just on saxophone or any instrument. Uh, now we talk a little bit about vibrato. Um, he tackles it decently, uh, but it's a little bit of a sad answer. Uh, it's still open to question. Um, Bach didn't outrightly say uh, anything, although there might have been some suggestion through research that um, he admired vibrato based off of his time at St. Uh, Jacoby, Jacoby in Hamburg, um, and the fact that there was a tremolo register that was installed during his time there and during his time of visit. Um, and so this fondness, they believe, might have been some inspiration to product usage or implementation or 
concepts behind it, at least that either performers decided to take usage or even himself within some of his writings um, a little bit deeper into this dissertation, as well as the Golominov, you'll see um, a little bit of discussion on trills. Um, which I'll get into in a little bit, but this kind of covered a little bit of vibrato about, well, what way did he actually write um, this idea? So I'll get into interpretation on ornamentation now because it'll touch it. So uh, first it says not to add extra notes. Um, the structure is already well built, especially as etude based work. Um, it's, he's a master for a reason, you know, he's written some very beautiful lines. Um, and lines is the best way to put it. You know, we've got multi polyphony going on here that we get to play with. So whether it's as an interpretation on a, a monophonic instrument or on a polyphonic instrument, I suppose in this case, or in string registral, um, it's important to remember that it's still written in some respects and there's still that concept of form we want to try our best to honor. Um, having said that though, there's still some level of ornamentation that has come across as approved. This might be a Baroque concept, um, but more what he talks about in his dissertation is trills. And it's so when he goes into trills a little bit, <coughs> excuse me, um, he talks about that it should aim to create these variations versus what would be a standard ornamentation. Of course, remember this is the Baroque times, so a lot of different ornamentations, they didn't really come into fuller fruition or get toggled enough or played with um, until now. Uh, for us, if we really, really take our time, uh, woodman players uh, feel like splitting our throats or even brass players, we could potentially work our butts off for multiphonics. But in this case, it just might not implement the best or sound the best and again, give a good performance into this respect. Um, so the trills in this case counted as that variation. Um, normally it occurred when it was on the same note, uh, stronger beat placement, etc. cetera. Um, and it's the trill itself, uh, has in recent times become a little bit more interpretive, but in Twillard's case, in his interpretation, and a lot of what I would agree with too in his writing, he says it should be in, performed as a trill without an interruption, a very natural flow, um, or used as an enhancer. Again, that's why it says it's kind of the only ornamentation mostly used, um, and it became the additive a little bit more emotion and fervor. So now, um, a little bit more the, way, the moment I've been waiting for, not necessarily. Um, I will be playing for you the Saraband. So this is the fourth movement of Suite 2, which is what you've been hearing. Um, this is obviously the Trent Kinniston arrangement, so I'll let you know it is in a different key. Um, so in case anything sounds really off right away, that would be why right to start. Um, the music to the right actually is uh, cello music that I snagged off Google Images. Hopefully it's okay. Um, just if you're following along, uh, what it would be is to be to negate the repeat signs in this case. Um, it's only a two minute performance and um, hopefully you enjoy. Feel free to uh, kind of keep in mind some of the concepts I was able to cover. Uh, see what you think of the interpretation and um, I'll let you guys decide later.
Okay. Um, ah, all right. So does anyone have any questions? I can exit from the share view and then go into chat or something, if that's all right with anyone. Anyone want to kind of chime in so I can hear? I'll do stop sharing right away, actually. Um, all right. Thank you guys so much for taking in my presentation. If you have questions, unmute yourself. I suppose I see 